Uh, thanks, Janet, and thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. So uh, I'm pretty sure some of you already know me um, because uh, I'm also technical director for the Biomedical Information Resource. So, uh, but today I'd like to talk a little bit kind of overview on what we can do beyond just uh, um, what we usually do as a kind of as a service. But of course, as you like mentioned, the great job, the stuff in the shared resource has been done. Uh, so, generally, we this kind of a lot of times what we are, our view is we start with thinking there is geno genotype changes. And genotype changes usually leads to some molecular changes like epigenetic changes, different histone mark binding over the genome, and uh, gene, gene expression level change, and as Raghu mentioned, morphology change. And, but when we study that from systems point of view, you really want, want a holistic approach to look at the organs. So this is zebrafish eye, if it's in 3D, or looking at the gene networks. And hopefully from there to look at the collective, collective properties and eventually hopefully to identify therapeutic targets or biomarkers or diagnosis markers. So generally in my research group, um, this is kind of like the three areas right now we are targeting. Fo I cannot say focusing because three areas, but we are targeting. Uh, so, and I'd like to mention again, just like I have a very close collaboration with Raghu, who, just, uh, who has just uh, spoken. And uh, so this is where kind of like the quantitative phenotyping part is, and I will not mention that. So instead of talking about uh, everything in here, I'd like just to give two examples on kind of like the potentially data we can mine out from basically using kind of pattern recognition approach because my background training was in electrical, electrical engineering and computer vision. So I want to start with an example on next generation sequencing and uh, probably we'll talk a lot about the technical details on those and what we can do, but I'm pretty sure you all hear so how, uh, how much trouble it has causing us because of huge amount of data and uh, in a way it's like too accurate and there's so much things we can mine. So, um, and I just want to use chip sequencing as one example. And chip sequencing, as we know, is uh, basically starting protein DNA sequencing. So in your day, no matter what sequencing you are doing, you start with kind of like those raw reads. And if you have done sequencing with pretty core, one thing you know is your day after the sequencing is done, a few days later, you got an email say, your data has been processed it's in this FTP site and download it. And when you download it, it's a huge text file. Don't try, even try to open it with Word, because most time your, uh, your file size is text file, but it's like 40 million lines of text or 100 million of text. So this is basically the raw data you really get. Most of you won't even look at it. And uh, this is some more meaningful data. Basically, you say, I got the sequences. It's mapped to the reference genome. But so what? You still got like 20, 000, 20 million, 40 million such, such things. So how can we make sense out of it? right? So one thing is, of course, how to even manage data and why you can get that email say like your data is here. It's actually not a trivial work. So the past four years, per this group and our group and the shared resource, by information shared resource stuff, especially Terry Camalango and Gucci Ozer and Celan um, Yamas, they have been working very cl closely and has done a fantastic job in setting up this pipeline so that we can have the data generated from the Illumina sequencer and get processed in very fast. In back in the good, good GA2 days, we can have it done in like almost 48 hours after sequencing. Now for now, for high sake, it's giving us much more data, so we are, the processing takes a little bit longer. But this, usually if you're doing a chip sequencing experiment, you can get the results, basically mapping results pretty fast. Comparing to some other university course, you have to wait weeks or months to get the results. Actually, they have done a fantastic job. Uh, so just very quickly, I'd like to use this as an example. I may skip some slides because of time. So per chip sequencing experiment is basically to use to study protein DNA interaction. Generally, using the antibody-based technology, you can put on specifically regions that bound, basically targeted by the protein of interest, and so that you end up with an enriched bunch of segments, DNA segments, that you can sequence. Once you sequence, usually the process is you will map those sequences back to the reference genome and trying to find the regions with a lot of mapping. And because that's where we believe those are potential DNA segments that could be bound, could be the target of the protein of interest. And uh, so from a, a data point of view, say like what we have done, we started with the sequences. We mapped to the location, basically the coordinates on the genome. 
Then we end up with actually we are counting at every genomic location to see how many segments have been mapped to that location by the histogram. In other words, it's a one-dimensional signal. Now suddenly, if you're engineering type, you know we suddenly transformed from the sequences all the way to a one-dimensional signal. And the people who have been doing like radar detection, speech recognition for the past 60 years, they have done this a lot on like how do we detect some peak in a one-dimensional signal, right? And moreover, because of the technology is so accurate, it's not just like the quantity, it's actually the shape, even the shape of such a binding actually have a lot of information. And so this is kind of like, you know, it's a global 3D view of the binding for every chromosome, or binding pattern for every chromosome. For example, here we are looking at one promoting histone marks and the RNA polymers to, for transcription. So you can see like the binding, oh, global binding pattern is very similar because it's not surprising. This H3K4 dime isolation mark actually promotes pr transcription. Then we can actually really look, start looking at the patterns of binding. So for example, on this side is we get, actually get from the breast cancer cell line, chip sequence data on the left side is for RNA polymerase two. on the right side is for uh, the histone mark. And using some machine learning technology, we can say actually we found four major combine the shapes or binding around the transcription starting site. And then from that, what we can, this is using the 16,000 genes from RIFSIC as a training, and then we can learn those shapes. Then we can further use those shapes to screen over the entire genome and to actually to identify regions which are unannotated but with similar patterns so that we can predict potentially new promoter regions. And this can be even can be done in other ways too. For example, looking at the RNA polymerase to binding patterns at transcription starting site with known high expression genes, we found it's not just the peak it matters, also the tail height also matters. And then we can use that to actually predict the potentially transcription starting site for microRNA genes because they are also transcribed by RNA polymerase too. So and even further, actually, by looking at histone mark bindings and we can identify some like tissue specific genes. In this case, it's as brain. And we found 329 genes that with heavy, as a transcription starting site here, with heavy tails of the H3K4 ME2 tail. And that's tissue specific. But turns out those kind of epigenetic mark was not just acquired in the mature brain stage. Some of them acquired that already in the neural progenitor stage. Some of them even acquired it back to embryonic stem cell stage. And very interestingly, now we group those genes into three groups. You look at how they are related to diseases. They have the embryonic stage genes and the neural progenitor stage genes, let's say the first one and the third one, they're very heavily enriched with the brain disease brain disease related genes. So that's actually give us a potential hint to see how those brain disease related genes even play a role back in the early development, developmental stage. So those analysis just now the next generation sequencing data as part of you talk about and can basically give us a lot of much more information than we previously can just by looking at the quantities. So some much deeper mining can enable us to do that. So of course, there are a lot of ongoing studies we are looking at different shapes. So this is actually an interesting study because for RNA polymerase two over region, not just binding, not just over the transcription starting site, but over region, this is actually very meaningful. So I talked with Raghu, I said, Raghu, we have this one dimensional signal data, it's very noisy. How can we identify region? Raghu said, why, why, why don't you use the algorithm that we are using for image denoising? So we actually took that algorithm, found that it works remarkably well. And so we are able to identify regions as long as like 300 kilo bases and match perfectly with the genes. And we can use that as to identify patterns, genes that has the RNA polymerase to pausing. Of course, there are some other uh, RNA-related uh, projects, like the one Wolfgang mentioned, Dr. Sadi mentioned earlier today. And we have a, a pilot study on whole genome sequencing. So this is kind of, in a way, is one example. How much time do I have? Okay. So. This is more like basic research still. So I'd like to mention one thing is if you want to move to translational, one thing is a lot of public data are there. 
So and public data is not just a sequence data. There could be a lot of microarray data, chip sequence, uh, genome sequence data, all those. Uh, if you have now the gene expression omnibus and you notice there for RNA expression data, at least there are more than half a million data already deposited. There are a lot of sequence data like chip sequence data, those things. So those are huge resource for people to can take advantage. If you are interested in cancer, the cancer genome atlas, as we know, it's like for 20 cancers, more than 500 types, more than 500 patients for each cancer, you have the gene expression data, you have exome expression data, microRNA expression data, uh, copy number variance data, SNP data, and some DNA methylation, uh, some uh, DNA sequence, somatic mutation, clinical information, and histological images. So it, if you want to generate some hypothesis first study, this could be a great source even before you do any experiments. And this is a recently published Nature paper by Broad Institute uh, and partnered with Novartis. They're generating this data for more than a thousand cancer cell lines. What they didn't say here is they are also actually doing drug response. Uh, they generating drug response data for those sound cell lines. And this is another public data set. It's actually from a conference. They have a contest. They're giving out 20, more than 21,000 microarray data for rats being treated with uh, different organs of the rats being treated with different human drugs. So those are potentially things that we can tap on to mine. And I just want to give like a very uh, in a way straightforward example on just mining some of those data. So we are starting with the simplest thing. Basically, if we have two genes, and two genes, they over a bunch of samples, they always show the same patterns, expression profiles. Biologically, we know there might be a reason. They could be regulated by the same transcription factor or microarray, or they participate in the same function, or they interact with each other. So no matter what the biological function reason is, we can actually use this kind of similarity as a metric to build gene networks. So two ways you build a gene network, you treat the genes as a node in the network, you draw the edge, and you can put a weight, basically the similarity score, such as Pearson correlation coefficient as a weight of the edge. Or another way is you can say, I can put a threshold on the weight, and I only draw an edge if there is high correlation between them. No matter what we do, there is always an algorithm we can tap on or we have published we can identify dense modules from such networks. And then we can ask a lot of interesting questions. For example, in this case, it's a recent study. With this side, we grabbed more than 30, uh, 33 data, cancer data sets. And to see which genes they always they frequently have co-expression with each other. On this side, is a normal tissue. And to see like them, what are the networks really we can identify and what are their functions? And the largest one is the cell cycle. And here you see immune response, a lot of immune response. And uh, there's metabolism, but there is extracellular matrix organization. So from there, we can generally say, can we, those are really kind of inconsistent with the hallmarks of cancers. And then we can use them to become features to separate the patient to different groups to see if they can pro predict the prognosis of the patients. And the similar approach is, I'm going to skip a lot, and you can predict the new functions of genes. And the same as a side product that we actually found, an, in the same study, we found a network that can be used to in a way to predict uh, the leukemia patient uh, staging information. And uh, using the same approach, we can apply to brain tumor study, identify like uh, epigenetic related networks, and uh, colon cancer study to identify potentially hotspot in the genome. And of course, there are a lot of ongoing work and uh, I, I will skip those, but uh, one thing I'd like to mention is looking beyond this is looking at nonlinear relationships between the genes. For example, using with Ragu together, we're using computational approach. We can identify so like microarrays over a bunch of samples show this kind of relationship. And what does it mean if you look at it? It's almost saying like they cannot be high at the same time. In other words, they mutually exclusive. They kind of mutually exclude each other. Directly or indirectly, we don't know. But that's generated a lot of hypotheses. So I'm going to uh, skip this. I'd like to mention is not just molecular can build networks. Diseases can be networks. Biological terms can be networks. Drugs can be networks. Literature, PubMed, abstracts can be networks. And uh, patient and drug can be bipartite networks. So there are a lot of things we can go on here. So just at the end, I would like to mention one thing. is We can generate a lot of hypotheses, but you really want to push forward. We have to work in a team with clinicians and biomedical researchers. Uh, but we have a lot of 
good lessons and bad lessons during the past 80 years. And I'd like to mention one thing is, usually one of those teams can be found into two caveats. One thing is if you think the data as a load and the tools as a wagon, and we want to move fast. One thing we learn is the best, the most best horses and the most shiny wagons may not always guarantee the fast mo moving speed. On the other hand, if we don't have good plan, we can generate our data but cannot find the matched capacity, we usually end up in this very often. <laughs> but we really want to do is a lot of communication over years of understanding, learning, mutual learning, and build trust of good views so that we can really kind of like have a faster back and win the race. Okay, thank you, and this is really the student and postdoc staff members who did the work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.